Beautiful. Amazing. Welcome, everyone. Thank you guys for um, being flexible. I know we're starting a few minutes late and uh, jumping into the breakout. My name is Zach Dillon. I'm a, a student pastor here at uh, Radiant Church. Um, I'm co-leading this session with another student pastor, uh, Pastor Preston Coles. He's currently on his face uh, getting wrecked in the sanctuary right now. So I'm like, let him lie. Let him lie. And um, it's good. We prep together. So he might jump in. If you see him come in like halfway through and he's like all blotchy and stuff, give him a little bit of grace. He's just getting getting encountered by the Lord. But uh, yeah, seriously, just wanted to, again, thank you all for coming uh, today for this breakout session. Again, uh, we're going to be talking about discipleship-centered student ministries. Discipleship-centered student ministries. Um, really quick, uh, raise your hand in here. I just want to kind of know who I'm talking to. If you work with Next Gen, maybe you're a, that's kids, students, you're a leader, you're a volunteer, you're a pastor, just raise your hand. Amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah, really grateful for, for you guys coming out. Um, this really quick, uh, kind of just quick introduction of who uh, me and Preston, we're going to imagine he's here uh, right now are. But so we... Um, me and Preston grew up together in Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, with David Perkins. So David Perkins, who was on the prayer panel uh, yesterday, he was our youth pastor growing up. And um, we graduated high school together in uh, 2012, and, um, and we grew up in a praying youth group, praying youth group. And I remember, uh, you know, being at big events and big conferences and, and, and big moments. And it's kind of like the classic mid-2000s youth ministry was our youth ministry expression. Some of you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, it means like, you know, we're putting a Happy Meal in a blender uh, and like whoever drinks it fast. But even we, we did some crazy stuff. We did a, made a coffin out of um, like see-through glass and we put a kid in there. And then we poured like 20,000 crickets on top of him, and like there's cockroaches and crickets crawling all over him while his team did like a, uh, like a, uh, yeah, like a fear factor. There it was. There was a fear factor night. We had a kiddie pool full of snakes that kids had to pick up with their mouths, you know, and like a kid got bit in the eye by a snake. And so that was my, my youth group experience <laughs> on Wednesdays growing up. But, but kind of in the same vein, there was, uh, Pastor David came in and, and really brought a heart for prayer. And, and, and here's the thing, is again, I've been in youth conferences, uh, I mean, six, 7,000 teenagers in a room, they're amazing. I mean, our youth group was over 1,000 kids growing up, like giant room full of teenagers, mega church youth group. But the thing that marked me and changed my life was teenagers praying in a prayer room. Teenagers praying in a prayer room. I remember I was 17 years old. grew up in, again, amazing youth ministry. But I remember going to a prayer room that we had at our church. It was a 24-7 prayer room. And I remember meeting Jesus in a prayer room. And the reason I'm standing in front of you today is not because I, you know, went to a cool youth conference or went to a cool youth group or really connected with a leader. It's because I really connected with Jesus in a prayer room. And, and what I want to uh, share with you today is a little bit uh, of our story, me and Preston, um, and kind of just in God's grace and sense of humor, uh, ended up putting us both here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, uh, pastoring our student ministry here. So I've been on staff for six and a half years working with the uh, student ministry department. Pastor Preston moved here three years ago. So uh, we've been kind of running together since that. He came on summer of 2019. An amazing time to start youth ministry, right? Um, <laughs> You know, as soon as you get a, a, a rhythm, it's like, oh, like COVID. So uh, we, we got to lead through COVID together, and um, it, it has been amazing, amazing leading with another uh, pastor leader who just has those roots of roots of, of revival, of a praying youth ministry. It's been such a blessing. But uh, what, what I want to do today is I want to share with you guys a little bit of our process um, that we have gone through in our student ministry here at Radiant Church and the, the process I believe the Lord led us through uh, to emphasize uh, prayer and discipleship as the core of our youth ministry. So um, kind of to, I, I'm going to kind of give you guys the timeline. We're going to talk through it and uh, we're going to process it together. But 2019, um, Pastor Preston comes on. I was a year, a little over a year in to being a student pastor at Radiant. And we, uh, previously to my time being student pastor, were very event-driven. 
Like, we had giant events every single month. It's like, hey, we're going to have a theme. We're going to give away a hoverboard and AirPods and pizza. And again, Pastor Davis saying, we're going to pop a bunch of balloons with our butts. And, uh, and it was very, very event-driven, event-focused. And, and with that, right, we received the benefit of having an event-driven youth ministry is that kids come to your events, right? Kids came to the events, and we uh, were running our programs, and I remember a year when we shifted to that, you know, it's like the first one, it's like 100 kids, and then it's 120, and 150, and then 200, and 250, 300, we're like, wow, like, God is moving, but um, what we saw is that kids would come on Wednesday nights, but then for the rest of the week, we couldn't get them to engage, and it's hard to remember their names, and hard to get them plugged in, and and it was a process. So, so when Pastor Preston came on, um, we sat down, and, and really the Lord uh, challenged us to identify our why. How many of you guys have heard Simon Sinek, uh, What's Your Why? You know what I'm talking about? So we uh, had a team retreat, and um, I remember it was like 1 in the morning, and we're just like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Uh, what's our why? And, and the Lord really challenged us to identify a clear why for student ministry. Because if, if we were being honest, and I think I would be honest in my experience, is that a lot of us in next-gen ministry, the why is because someone told you to do it, right? The why is because, hey, we need next-gen ministry, and you're the guy. You have a call of God on your life, and this is going to be an amazing opportunity for you to grow and develop and love this next generation, right? Like, a lot of, for a lot of us, the why is because someone, like, tapped us on the shoulder and be like, I see this in you. And that's not a bad why, but I believe in this next decade, we need a bigger why for our ministry than just someone asked us to do it. We need a bigger why for next-gen ministry than it's just what churches do, right? Like if our why is we need a comfortable kids' ministry so tithers will be comfortable. If we have a youth ministry that our why is we need to keep parents happy because we're telling their kids not to have sex and don't do drugs. We need something bigger. So we were really challenged by that. And what we began to wrestle with is what's our why? What's our why for, for what we're doing and everything we're doing? And from that, uh, we kind of identified values and, and uh, that evolved into our mission statement. Um, our mission statement at Radiant Students is we exist to build uh, resilient disciples who have life-changing encounters with God, who transform families and schools in our city. Resilient disciples who experience life-changing encounters with God, who transform, is this outside, that music? I'm like, whoa. Like, we got the worship breakout behind us or something. Um, uh, resilient disciples, life-changing encounters with God, transforming families and schools in our city. And that process for us of identifying that, again, that was the first step, but it began to challenge everything else that we did. Once we identified our values and our mission statement, what we began to do is say, okay, this is our mission statement. Does this reflect the way we spend our budget? Does this reflect the way we spend our time? Does this reflect the way we structure our ministry? And so jump forward a few more months, and then COVID hit. And, and honestly, for us, COVID was a massive blessing in the sense that COVID was a, uh, a clear moment to reset what we were doing and come in step with the Spirit, right? Revelation 2 and 3, again, you read it in every single one of the churches Jesus speaks to. He says, blessed is he who hears what the Spirit is saying to the church. The need of this hour is not next-gen ministers who see what God is doing somewhere else but hear what he's saying about where they're at right? It's so easy to even come to a conference like this. And I guarantee there's a lot of you guys in this room be like, oh, I need to figure out like, what's Radiant doing. I need, what are they doing in their youth ministry? How I'm going to take, my senior pastor wants me to come back with a new small group strategy. I'm like, we need to stop copying people and hear from the Lord. Legit. Like, again, and there's great strategy. I love strategy. But if our strategy is to steal the best thing from another youth ministry, like, that's just... We, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. And um, w the question that we were kind of brought to was this, is uh, does our process drive our ministry or does our ministry drive our process? 
Does our process drive our ministry or does our ministry drive our process? And we began to look at our schedule, look at our budget, look at what we were doing. And what we realized is so much of our youth ministry expression existed because that's what youth ministries do, not because God called us to do it. So practically, practically, um, an example of that is our junior high ministry. We, uh, we looked at, we were looking at what we were doing, and it's like, okay, we're running orange curriculum, three weekend services a week, and we have a summer camp, and we're like, does that reflect our mission and our value to make Radiant Disciples? And it's like, no, it doesn't. Like, is like teaching like moral, like moralistic lessons to kids, and we do one camp a year, and like, we did laser tag one night. Like, is that making disciples? But we had a really good small group. Is that making disciples? And no, it wasn't. Just being honest. So COVID was a, was a blessing for us. And um, so the question kind of for you guys, I want to just give for you guys today, even at this conference, that I encourage you guys to, to wrestle with is what has God called you to do as a youth pastor? What has God called you to do as a next-gen leader, specifically you, specifically in your context, specifically with your kids, specifically in, in your area of leadership? What has God called you to do? And if it's just to build a youth ministry, that's not good enough. Like, if you're calling, if you're like, I'm just here because I'm, I'm the youth pastor, like, that's not good enough. It's crazy. Me and Preston were talking about this, and um, it's just, it's, this process for us is, is exposed a blind spot, I believe, in young leaders that we talk to where we're like, hey, what's your mission statement? What's your why? And nine out of 10 next-gen pastors that I ask that question to can't answer me. They're like, well, our mission statement is we build the youth. We pastor the youth. It's like we need a stronger why, a stronger why, and a clearer why, a clearer word from the Lord than I'm just here to hang out with teenagers on a Wednesday night because that's what my senior pastor asked me to do. Your, the question you need to ask yourselves is how can you take the mission and the vision from your house, from your senior pastor, and how does that contextualize to where you're at? Specifically, specifically. Again, we need specific mission, specific values. So that was Preston's session. I know way shorter than he would have gotten, so, yeah. Um, but, but what I want to share with you guys now is kind of as we hit that missions statement piece, uh, kind of that conversation that took place in, in our hearts and in our conversation. And uh, uh, it really started with a book that we read called Faith for Exiles by David Kinman. Raise your hand if you've read that book. So everyone needs, I was going to bring a free copy and give it to somebody, but again, on the floor crying last session, so I forgot it in my office. <laughs> but if you have not read Faith for Exiles by David Kinnaman, you need to order it on Amazon today and get it. Faith for Exiles is Barna Research's uh, study where they identify that 66% of young people are leaving the church the year after they graduated in high school. 66%, nearly 7 out of 10 young people are leaving the faith the year after they get out of our youth ministries. Again, I know this is like even, we've been saying this for a few years now. This data thing is 2019. But again, I can only imagine what the data is now post-COVID. And when it came out, you know, I heard it a lot. Lots of people were saying it. But I feel like we haven't been talking about it as much this past season. Youth pastors and leaders, we have to look at the numbers and realize that 70% of our kids, if, are, are, from what we've been doing, are leaving the faith after they get out of our youth ministries. 70% of the kids that show up to your Cinco de Mayo taco party, right? 70% of the kids that come to your firework extravaganza. I didn't. I had a youth pastor, sorry, I'm just a little loose, but he, we wanted to do youth nights in the summer called Hot Summer Nights. <laughs> I'm like, bro, I'm like, you got to talk to some Gen Z, man. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> no Hot Summer Nights uh, for our kids. 70% um, of the kids that went to Hot Summer Nights aren't uh, following Jesus anymore. <laughs> but we, we were re reading this book, and in it, he talks about David Kinnaman talks about this principle called resilient disciples. 
and he identified that there's a subset of the population of young people that are leaving or uh, that are leaving youth ministry, but they're holding to their faith, they're evangelizing, they're operating and calling, they're uh, tithers in the church, they're building healthy homes, and, and he uses this phrase called resilient disciples. And I could spend, honestly, the rest of the time talking about that to you guys, but we felt the Lord highlight that phrase to us, resilient disciples. And, and even if we built it into our mission statement, we exist to make resilient disciples. Our mission and our heart as Radiant students, what that has looked like for us is I don't care how many kids come on a Wednesday night. I care how many kids are following Jesus when they graduate. With that, this is just an observation I have. I believe like this past couple decades in youth ministry, we've defined success through the lens of an evangelist. You know, so Ephesians 4, fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. We have defined success in the context of an evangelist. What I mean by that is we've defined success as how many kids can I get in the room and I'm going to preach the gospel to them. That's, that's, the, that's the excuse. I'm kind of, that's the language we use is we're going to do all this stuff because they got to hear the gospel. They're lost. Invite your lost friends. Hear the gospel. And we just got to tell them the gospel. And, and don't hear me wrong, I think there are some people that are genuinely called to that, but I think that we've seen that model and we have blanketed it over all of Next Gen Ministries. And the result has been we get a lot of people that are coming in the building, but we have very little depth. I believe that God is restoring the prophet and the teacher to Next Gen Ministries. God is restoring the prophet and the teacher to Next Gen Ministries. And if we are going to build disciples that last the distance, we need a prophetic spirit that discerns the spirit of the age and creates culturally discerning young people that can engage in TikTok conversations, right? Where they read, they, they see a TikTok theologian and they're like, let me evaluate again, that against the word of God. Let me take what I'm seeing, or let, hey, I got friends at the lunch table, they're talking about all these things. Let me take this conversation and evaluate it against the word of God. We need theologically sound young people, and if the only message, the only Bible your young people are hearing on Wednesday nights is, Jesus died for you, and you, know, you can say yes if you raise your hand right now, and we got pizza afterwards. Why are, we, why are we surprised that young people are walking away when that's been their experience? God loves you so much. It's like, what about hell? What about my gay friend? I'm, it's, it's not surprising when you see a generation deconstructing and you look at the theological content they were fed. It's not surprising. We need teachers back in student ministry. And with that, there's this whole idea that it's like, you can't talk to your kids more than 20 minutes. And, you know, like, the value is like, we need small groups to teach the word. Can I, this is a soapbox for me, but I think that we have undervalued the power of the word of God. We have undervalued the value of preaching the word of God. And instead, we're like, we're going to let them talk about it by themselves. And don't hear me wrong, there's a value for small groups, but there is power in the word of God. There is power in the word of God. I think we need youth pastors that get up and have a word from God and preach the word with conviction, the whole counsel of the word of God so that we have theologically formed young people. I think another, another aspect of this, this conversation, and this is what we were wrestling with, is um, I think that for a lot of millennials, even specifically, um, we, we have had a view of ministry as a means to our ends of feeling significant. And I think that the next generation is paying the price for that. Young people deconstructing their faith is the fruit of youth pastors tr using young people to feel like we're significant. Because we care more about getting them in the room and telling your youth pastor friends that I had... I had 100 kids last week. Because that makes you feel good. Then you care about theologically forming resilient disciples. Right? And I think, I, I believe in this hour, the Holy Spirit is, um, is shifting youth pastors specifically from a Saul mindset to a Samuel mindset. Saul, Saul used the anointing of God to build his own kingdom. 
to hide his insecurity and to try to numb his fear of man. Saul put on the priestly robes, right? He, he put on the ephod when he was trying to make God do something for him. Samuel comes, and the primary ministry of Samuel is to anoint the next king. And I think we need next-gen leaders and pastors that aren't looking to ministry and looking to God to heal a sense of insecurity in your heart, but actually you recognize that the value and the purpose of your life is not to be the next cool youth pastor in town, but it's to call out and raise up the next generation of Daniels. I don't know about you guys, but I was shaking in my spirit last night from John Tyson talking about Josiah's revival to Daniel. That is wild. I've never heard that before. But we need, as youth leaders, youth pastors, we need to get over our insecurity and tap into a bigger vision. I, I just believe the f- young people, Gen Z deconstructing is the fruit of insecure youth leaders and youth pastors for the past two decades. So we're reflecting on all this, and, and honestly, like, it's a lot of self-reflection, right? Because this is, this is all stuff that was in me, you know? This is, this is all stuff that I was processing through in COVID. And we all felt, if you led through COVID, you get it. You know, it's like you have your youth ministry, your kids ministry, and you come back and you look at the attendance and all of a sudden it's like a third of what it was before, right? And you're like, where are all those kids that help me feel good about myself? Where are all those kids that help me feel like I was actually making a difference? Right? So we're processing this and And from that point, we just defined, like, our, our win, our mandate is we are going to raise up missionally-minded, resilient disciples from a context of prayer and encounter with God. That's the win. That's the lane. That's what we're going to do. And, um, and, again, I think that can, should look different for you guys. Like, that can look different. But that was our, our why. And, and, and what I want to do for the next... Um, next few minutes, is I want to talk about how that implemented practically for us, how that was expressed practically. And this is not like, this is hopefully maybe to give you guys some cool ideas, but this is not to tell you guys, if you want your youth ministry to grow, do it like this, right? Like, this is not what I'm trying to do today is come up and say, do this, do this, do this, and then you'll have a prayer-centered youth ministry. I would much rather say, this was our process, and this is how God led us in this season. So um, a big thing that, that we worked through was uh, our pizza slice. I've heard of the net. How many of you guys have, have seen this before? I think everyone should have a handout. The kind of net analogy for your ministry, wide net, small net. We call it a pizza slice because we're in youth ministry. So <laughs> it just connects, connects a little better. But um, in this process of saying, okay, like, what are we called to do? What's our mission statement? And where is our time, talent, and resources being allocated? A big tool that helped us to do this was our pizza slice. So we have our pizza slice right here. Um, so what this kind of slice represents, what it uh, is a picture, is you have wide up top, which uh, repre- represents accessibility. How easy is it to access events at this spot? The deep section it represents a uh, vision and culture, like how potent, how connected is uh, what's going on to your vision. So I'll do access and vision. Access and vision. So what we began to do is we began to map out our events and what we were doing onto this, onto this graph. So for us, um, we, uh, we do quarterly big events. We still want to do fun events. We still want to have fun with kids. Family, uh, our language is family prays hard and plays hard together. Like we want to model family value and family culture by having a lot of fun with our kids. So we do quarterly big events um, with our kids. And again, those, those events 
They're easy to access. Um, they are fun. They're definitely more like evangelistic uh, focus. Those are the fun events where it's like, hey, invite your friends. We're going to be lighting off like $1,000 worth of fireworks for the 4th of July, or we do a big Super Bowl party. Like, invite your friends. This is a great opportunity to expose uh, young people to the church. But, um, yeah, so th- that's our big events that we do quarterly. Kind of moving down, moving down, what I would say is that the, the next thing that we landed on was our services. We have, uh, for our student ministry, we oversee 5th through 12th graders. 5th through 12th. We break that up into junior high, which is 5th, 6th, and 7th, and then senior high, which is 8th through 12th. It's kind of weird, but it works really good. Um, We pull up the last grade of elementary into our middle school program, and then the last grade of middle school into our senior high program. So what happens is that before Uh, middle school students ever step foot on a high school campus, they have community with upperclassmen who love Jesus and are discipling them. Yeah. So it's weird. You got to communicate it to parents a few times, but the practical implementation of it is really fun. So, uh, but with that, we do Sunday mornings for our junior high, Wednesday nights for our senior high. So our weekly services, that's like next down on our pizza slice. Right, like a little bit more deep, a little bit more connected to our vision, but still pretty open, right? So pretty accessible. You got unchurched kids, kids inviting their friends. We want them to invite their friends to our Wednesday nights. Um, Next down is our student leadership program, which I'm going to talk about more in a minute. Student leadership. And then I'll say at the bottom is our trips and camps. Quarterly big events, weekly services, student leadership and discipleship, trips and camps. With this conversation of wanting to identify how do we make resilient disciples, um, we were talking with our team, praying with our team, and, and I believe my discipleship philosophy is this, is that disciples are made by a few strategic big moments that are stewarded by a lot of faithful small moments. A few strategic big moments that are stewarded by a lot of faithful small moments. And I think, in general, there's, there's typically a spectrum, and a lot of churches fall really strong on one side or the other side, right? It's the churches that are all about, like, camps, events, encounter, but then do not have weekly rhythms, to enforce that discipleship or they're all about like hey we just need to teach in the word of God and be there and you know Bible knowledge and this and this and this and you know I don't but they reject what they would say the camp high you know we're not about emotional experience we're not about camp high and and what I believe is that we need both of those intention to form resilient disciples right I'm here today because I had an encounter with God as a 12 year old at a camp that encounter was stewarded by years and years of small discipleship conversations. We need both. And those moments are reflected on this spectrum. So our student leadership program, I want to talk about that for a minute just because um, even as we're talking about praying churches, I think it's it's one of the things that we stumbled upon that I believe God has anointed and and it's in a unique way for for our house. And um, so we, on Monday nights, again, we have a Wednesday night, senior high service, we have a Sunday morning junior high service. On Monday nights, we have a a thing we call student leadership, where we have student leaders uh, from both of our campuses. We have have two campuses here in Kalamazoo. Junior high and senior high come down to our downtown prayer center, and we own the Monday night prayer meeting. So we rally students from across our whole city, and we say, Monday nights, this is the core of what we're doing. And uh, it's amazing seeing, uh, you know, suburb moms and their Tahoes going down one-way streets downtown the wrong way, (laughs) asking me where to park. I love it. I love it. But um, in this question of how do we make resilient disciples, we're like, we need life-changing encounters in the presence of God 
in weekly small rhythms. And that pushed us to more than just our weekly services. We need a discipleship engine for our kids. So on Monday nights, we have uh, almost 90 junior high and senior high students that have signed up for a 10-week semester, and we own the Monday, the Monday night prayer meeting. We have an hour of prayer from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. We do around 30 minutes of discipleship, leadership teaching, and then we break up into small groups and discipleship. That's our small group expression. I don't do small groups on my weekly services. Honestly, I just feel like it's not. I would much rather have a high impartation power encounter with God for new students and then have the conversation afterwards right, of what happens, and then pastor them a conversation following that, then making conversation the main thing that we do on our Wednesday nights. But on Mondays, Mondays, again, we have students come from all over our city to take their place on the wall and encounter God in his presence. And it's amazing, guys. Like, we have fifth graders that come in, and it's their you know, nine, 10 years old, they come in in the first week, they, they look around the room and, you know, their senior high, senior high students praying in the spirit, praying on the mic, doing all this stuff. And they get big eyes, you know, these little kids looking around being like, what's going on? And, you know, we, when it's an hour long, so they're like, you know, it's 20 minutes in and they're just dead. You know, all the junior high boys are like coloring on each other with Sharpie and like, <laughs> Got some junior high girls doing TikToks in the back of the room. <laughs> you know, we, like, get them back in. But, but what we see, right, and again, it's a prayer meeting. We're not doing games beforehand. We're not trying to make them comfortable. We are throwing them all the way to the deep end of the pool. But what we see is that the second week, all of a sudden, they engage a little bit more. The third week, that, you know, one junior high kid's raising his hands. You know, that fourth week, that kid that was sleeping the whole time is woken up. <laughs> Arise, O oh sleeper, the light of Christ <laughs> may shine upon you. Um, and as the semester we do it in a semester system develops, all of a sudden we see young people catch a burden for prayer and encounter with God in a prayer room context. See, fifth graders get up on the mic and begin to pray for their schools. You know, we have this fifth grader, his name's Asher, he's prophetic. Yeah, I need him to pray for me. <laughs> but this fifth grader gets up on the mic, and again, like, new kid, figuring things out, gets up on the mic, and begin, <laughs> starts praying. He's like, Lord, your word says the righteous are as bold as lions. God, release righteousness and boldness over a generation. Gets up, God, there's a spirit of laziness and entertainment in our high schools. God, I break off a spirit of boredom off of my high school and release passion for Jesus. I'm like, what? This kid is 12, this kid's 12 years old. 12 years old. He's a sixth grader. How does that happen? We're not trying to entertain him. We're not trying to convince him that we're cool, so you should come and hang out with us. We're not trying to bribe him with pizza in stupid games. Right? We're giving him the real thing. What you catch them with is what you'll keep them with. What you catch them with is what you'll keep them with. And that Monday night, I'd say, is the core of everything that we're doing here at Radiant Church. It's more than having a youth ministry that's built around cool small groups, built around a cool service, built around cool games. I want to build a youth ministry built around the presence of God in a prayer room. And we're seeing young people encounter God in a prayer room and go out and evangelize to their friends. I would much rather hear a story of a young person, or I, if I'm going to hear a salvation story in my youth ministry, I would a hundred times more rather hear a testimony of a kid sharing the gospel to their friend in their school than uh, a story of, I invited a friend and they heard the gospel from you. If you're the only person that their friends are hearing the gospel from, we've lost that battle, right? If you're the only evangelist in your youth ministry, we've lost the battle. More than youth pastors operating as evangelists as a way to heal their insecurity, we need Samuels and prophets to call out the next generation of evangelists to go to this next generation. And even big picture, guys, I, I feel a, a burden. We're the first generation that can honestly say we can finish the Great Commission in our generation, right? 
You look at missiologists, we can do it. We can do it. They're finishing translating the Bible into every single language, like 2025. Like, we're there. What's the need of the hour? It's laborers. It's laborers. And currently, amazing programs that have a heart for the Great Commission, like YWAM and, and others, are taking the 1% from our church and trying the best to send them to the mission field. And a lot of those kids are burning out and deconstructing. This for me, this is what, what I'm praying, what I'm feeling from the Lord. Um, this next decade, my goal for Radiant students for Next Gen at Radiant Church is I want to send a tithe of our kids to the mission field. What would it look like if success for your church looks like we're going to send a tithe of the next generation to fulfill the Great Commission? Not, I'm going to use my budget, my talents, my gifts to get a bunch of kids in the room so I feel good about myself. We need Samuel youth pastors who will rise up and call out evangelists and kings in the next generation. What I'll say too, this pizza slice, this looked very different when me and Pastor Preston started our conversation. It's like we had this like maybe way down there and we didn't even resource allocation. This is a, so I would encourage you all. We gave you this pizza slice. We gave you this thing to identify your mission statement really clearly. What's your mission statement? It should overflow from your church. That your pizza slice from access to vision, what's everything that you're doing on it? And, and, and I would ask you as well, what percent of your time, talent, and resources are dedicated to each one of these things? We found 60% of our money and our time and our planning meetings was going to this. And it's like, that's valuable, but is that what we're called to do? No. We're called to make disciples, which happens best down here. So we flipped our budget on its head. We cut back events, cut back things, all, again, in conversation with our senior pastors, our oversight, saying, we, this is what we're called to do. Can we shift our focus from up here to down here? And guess what? When we did that, we lost students. Students stopped coming. Kids that used to come for the games and different things, they stopped coming. And you know what that told me? Is why were they coming in the first place? And again, don't hear me wrong. We still do fun stuff. We still do fun events. We want to be evangelistic and give kids an opportunity to have a great time and invite their unsafe friends, but we shifted the resource allocation weight to where we felt called to. So I'd encourage you, as you build this pizza slice um, out, even like this put down by each one, what percent of your budget, your planning meetings, and your volunteer resources go to each one of these things? Um, as it comes for even like trips and camps, right? Like we, we love those events. Again, so many of us are here because we encounter God at a trip and event. One thing that we do uh, each summer that's been instrumental for us is we uh, attend Bold Conference in Kansas City. Pastor David Perkins runs uh, his student conference there. We've been there from the very start. Uh, pastor Kenny Grasha in the back. Uh, he's Pastor David Perkins, youth pastor. He's going to be kind of taking point with some bold stuff this year, but um, having strategic moments of encounter is so significant for your kids. So I know um, I was kind of all over a little bit today. Sorry, I'm still a little, a little swirly from that last session. But, um, but more than anything, right, I wanted to walk you through our process. Identify your why. Identify your mission statement. Identify your values. Do some self-reflection. Is your ministry about you feeling good about yourself or about accomplishing the mission that God has given you? And then map it out. What are you called to do? How does it translate? And then what's your resource allocation look like towards it? It's really not that uh, complicated. It's not that revelatory. But I believe this is if every single one of you guys do this, do this, your youth ministry will stop looking like everyone else's youth ministry and will start looking like your youth ministry. Instead of, you know, 
scrolling online, looking at the next big mega church youth ministry and be like, they're having a Fortnite tournament. We need to do a Fortnite tournament. They had a slime mountain. You know, you're texting your intern, make me a slime mountain. <laughs> God bless. You're an intern in here. We just bless you in abundance. <laughs> Every spiritual blessing. Um, but our, our, our assignment to the next generation in this next decade Guys, it can't be, can't be a tool to heal our insecurity. It can't be a stepping stone. We're losing 70% this next generation. 70%. And I believe if we are going to change that, we need kids pastors that won't be afraid to make some parents mad. by shifting the focus from cute moralism and comfortable stories to power encounters with kids. Guess what? Some people might leave the church. They're leaving anyway when they leave high school. Don't hear me wrong. We need to be pastoral, but we cannot compromise the call of God on our generation to try to make people feel welcome. Um. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes, we got like 10 minutes, is just kind of do some Q&A. Pastor Preston, everybody. You want to jump up here, Pastor Preston? <laughs> Getting blessed in that meeting. I definitely didn't do it as good as you would have, but it's all right. Yeah, no, I don't know. Um, and also, we got our book, Who Does Not Have Faith for Exiles and Wants It? This guy right here. Raise your hand first. You got Faith for Exiles. Yes, this is my copy. I just finished. All right, brother. Yeah. There you go. Bless you, man. Um, but I uh, would love to answer any questions you guys have about our process, um, even how we implemented that mission statement, our pizza slice, student leadership, uh, any of those things. Yes. Yeah, we use bold. We use you, Kenny, and everything you have to offer. Um, no, I think with this, the trips, the camps, the retreats, the conferences, the everything, I like leaning into these as core, I love them because it actually kind of involves the whole pizza slice, right? You get some high impact relationship building, games, you know, fun, pizza nights, whatever. Like we play. You know, we'll go on retreats, and we take our student leaders to a, a retreat center twice a year, and we play murder in the dark for, like, three hours, and kids get super mad, but we have fun. We, en we enjoy it. We have, like, some, some more, like, kind of engaging moments, but then we get, like, those, that, that moment to go deep, those encounter moments, and so I think they're kind of near the bottom. They're, they, I, I don't know, again, I missed 45 minutes of Zach's wonderful teaching, but, um, like our mission statement, it's multifaceted, right? Like we exist to make resilient disciples who have life-changing encounters in the presence of God, who transform schools and families in our city. Like it's missional, it's encountering, and it's disciple-making. And so this kind of down here relays all of that. It kind of it, it encompasses the entire mission statement. Where up here, it's, you know, maybe some more discipleship focus, like relational building. And then as we continue going out, or this would be discipleship. This is like relational. This is, you know, maybe some missional. We just got out of a revival history series out of our youth nights on Wednesdays and Sundays of just like, hey, go be a revivalist for your campus. Like, here's what's happened before. We can see it, do it done again. And so anyway, sorry, I know I just talked a little bit longer on your question. But that's, that's my, like, my take on kind of the deeper moments encompassing more of why we exist. Yeah, and a practical thing we do as well with that, and even you asked Kenny, is like how do you go to somebody else's vision, somebody else's culture and incorporate it into yours? Is This is super practical, but we run a two or three day camp after a conference. Yeah. 
So we'll go to a, somebody else's conference, and then we follow it up with our own camp. We, like, run a camp center somewhere. Like, we would go to a conference in Kansas City and then go to St. Louis, or I went to Kentucky one year. And then we run our own services and camp kind of follow up after conference. So we use conference for heavy impartation, and then we uh, you do our camp for follow-up pastoral connect with the kids. And honestly, like, we love conference, but I, I'm crazy about that camp after. Like, that's where God has moved in some really significant ways for us. But, yeah. Jackson. Yeah, you, you cast the vision and you beat it like a drum. Every one of our leaders know why we exist. We exist to make resilient disciples. We plaster it all over our walls. We say it a thousand times on a Wednesday night. We repeat it every Sunday morning before we start junior high. We say, chase students, go make disciples. This is why we exist. This is unto everything that we do. And when you cast vision like that, people buy in, right? Like people, people follow vision. Where there's no vision, people perish. But when you, and when it's, when you get the leaders that want to show up, the ones that care, and you get like, hey, guys, we're switching it up. We're no longer about, you know, we're literally inverting our pizza slice. Like, the ones that care, the ones that are here for discipleship, and, you know, just like the students, you know, how some will leave when, when we don't put emphasis on this and more on this. Like, same with our leaders. The ones that are there to make disciples as well, man, they stay. They buy into the vision. They go hard. They run further than you even ask them to run. They're taking kids out to coffee, you know, yeah. four or five days a week. And then you, as leaders, as, as the staff and the pastoral staff, you are only as good as your leaders, yeah. right? So how are you discipling your leaders, yes. right? You can't let them run themselves dry because they bought into your vision and they're all hyped up and then they go and, you know, burn themselves out. How are you? I, when I first moved here three years ago, I was like, I'm not even, for this first six months, I don't care about students, I'm not trying to build a relationship with students right now. I need a lead team. I need leaders who are going to help me accomplish our vision. And so I invested all of my time, all my energy into leaders and bought them into the vision. And now they're faithful. You know, they're, they're, they're leading with me. They're running with us. And so Zach and I do that. Like we, we chase hard after our leaders because then, I mean, that's the, that's the disciples, right? Jesus had his three. He had his 12. He had his 70. And it flowed down from there. And you know, investing your time into the ones that matter. I know as a youth pastor, it's kind of like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta chase students. It's all about students. I gotta, you know, this sixth grader, I gotta take them to coffee or go to, you know, and you do, but you will be more effective if you put just as much time and energy into your leaders. Yeah. Like if you build a foundation on discipling leaders and helping them be healthy and buying into your vision, oh, it doesn't matter if there's 10 kids or 100 kids on your, on your youth night. You're going to be able to sustain whoever walks through the door because your leaders are healthy. They're passionate. They know the vision. They know why they're there, right? They're not, oh, I'm here to make, hang out with my friends, or I'm here because my friend serves. Or like, no, no, no. They're here because we exist to make resilient disciples, and everything we do is unto that. And so they're bought into that. So you, sorry, you beat it like a drum. That's how. And I would, I would also say, <laughs> there it is, full circle. I'd also say you can make this pizza slice with your leaders, yeah. right? More than just your kids, how are you discipling your leaders? And a lot of it is, is, Doubling up. My best leaders are the ones that had crazy encounters with God on student trips and retreats. Haley Hawks in the back of the room. She's one of our youth coordinators. Even Haley Mosley is our central youth admin. They're incredible. We're so grateful for them. Haley Hawks was a junior sophomore when I moved here in student ministry. And so I was her youth pastor and she interned with me. But I'd say Haley is on staff today, call of God, incredible communicator, leader, because she had an encounter with God as a leader on a youth trip right? Like the, your trips and conferences, they're not just about your kids encountering the Lord's for everybody. So yeah. Yeah. Three years. We're challenging discipleship in every other department. Our Monday night prayer meeting is the most attended prayer meeting of the week. Outside of our student one on, or our all staff one on Tuesday mornings, we have an all staff Tuesday morning. Our Monday night next gen prayer meeting is the biggest prayer meeting of the week. Other departments are coming in and they're like, "How can I get a prayer meeting?" And it's like, "There's 15. Pick one." <laughs> one minute. Last question.
Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah. No, that's a great question. Great clarifying question. Yeah. Student leadership. It's, you know, anybody can join student leadership, but then also anybody can join our trips and camps, you know, but like bold conference. I mean, we sell out. So it's like they, it's high engagement. And students. even cost would be that like there's a pay a uh, payment threshold and some of those things. Yeah. But yes, anybody can go. And, and honestly, we Again, using like our retreat, like fall retreat, everybody loves fall retreat, right? It can be viewed as a, a big event, a big three-day, two-night event that you can have fun. You throw, you know, you throw slime at each other. You eat nasty mayonnaise, you know, covered hot dogs, whatever. I don't know. I guess people may put mayonnaise on their hot dog regardless. Maybe that's not that gross. Somebody's taking notes in the back. <laughs> mayonnaise on hot dog. But so, yeah, it's, it's kind of, yes, it's, it's open for everyone. And then we, we even, if you take like our but fall the purpose retreat, of it, the purpose of it is not to, we want a bunch of new kids to come and have fun. Right. It's, I want people to get wrecked by the presence of God yeah. and get, and get brought into a mentorship relationship where they're going to get discipled. Yeah. 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 Funnel them in, funnel them into the presence. Yeah. No, that's good, Kenny wise wisdom in the back left yeah like hey, last thing i'd say as we make disciples and as we engage kids we need to stop watering down the presence of god and watering down our faith gen z wants the real thing they've been given like diet christianity for the past 20 years because we're afraid it's going to offend them. It's created a deconstructing, apathetic generation. We need encounters with God on our Wednesday nights. We need the presence of God. We need the gifts of the Spirit. We, uh, uh, yeah, we have unchurched kids coming into our Wednesday nights, and they're getting words of knowledge called out, falling on the floor, encountering God, getting saved. That's what I want. That's what I want. Not I talked in small groups for six months, and then I left. An encounter with God, but we love to pray for you guys before you, before you leave. We're so grateful for all of you for coming. And and my prayer, right, is that maybe you got a few ideas practically, but more than that, more than that, that there would be context, context for you in your assignment to hear from the Lord, to identify it, and to implement it. That you would not be an echo of the next big youth ministry that you're watching on Instagram, but that you would fulfill God's assignment for your life in your context. So Lord, right now I just lift up all these amazing leaders. God, these youth pastors, youth leaders, next-gen leaders, and Holy Spirit, right now, I ask that you would speak to them clearly. You would speak to them clearly. I ask for a word from heaven over each of their hearts, over each of their, their youth ministries, that you would give them clarity in their assignment. God, I ask right now uh, just for healing over insecurity in our hearts. God, we do not want to use the gifting and the calling of God to try to heal insecurity. Lord, today we find our identity in you, Lord, and we say, we say, God, wherever you put us, wherever you send us, Lord, we want to be in step with you. So, God, would you give the strategy of heaven, and I ask for praying churches and praying youth ministries to spring up all around this country, God, that, that the next generation would not, be, would not be engaged by Christianity light, but would be engaged, engaged by the full expression and power of the gospel. Uh, God, we ask for encounters just for every one of their students today, um, that you'd be with them. God, I just ask for grace over this, everyone that's feeling weary, feeling tired, Lord, that you would give them grace to, to stay faithful to run the distance. Lord, we love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Blessings to you guys.